I'll start the YouTube streaming. Okay, uh, are we ready to start, Elaine? Yeah. Okay, uh, okay we, are, we are happy to have Elaine Wag uh, for her second lecture on the large deviations of Peseli and uh, while Peterson type molested. Please take it away. Thank you very much. Uh, so yesterday I uh, advertised that I will talk about the link between SLE and the Peterson type molested space. And yesterday we have been only talking about so yesterday we have only been talking about this connection between SLE and Lovna energy by the large deviation by letting the parameter of kappa goes to zero. And uh, so just remind you what we did yesterday is that we started with uh, Brownian motion, how is that related to um, Dirichlet energy by Schroeder theorem. And then we introduce SLE and the Lovner energy, which is applying a Lovner transform to Brown motion and to the Dirichlet energy of the driving function. If you apply square root kappa times Brown motion, the Lovner transform, you get the simple curve uh, called SLE kappa. And uh, the Lovner energy is defined to be the Dirichlet energy of the driving function. And because of the Schroeder theorem, uh, it's natural to guess that the Lovner energy has to be the large deviation rate function of SLE when kappa goes to zero. And that was indeed the case. And we also showed from this probabilistic interpretation about the Lovner energy, um, we get the energy reversibility from SLE reversibility. And that is one example of how we prove a deterministic result using just probabilistic object. So today I'm going to uh, generalize this chordal energy. So this here, all that is about chords, SLE are chords, love and energy are for chords, but going to generalize for Jordan curves. Jordan curves are simple loops on the complex plane. And you will see there are even more symmetries, not only from this reversible, when you change the orientation of the chord, the energy is preserved, but also there's the other symmetries inside this, in the loop setup. And then we would relate to the Peterson type from the space. Uh, so my apologies. So in order to tell you what is this, uh, the other side of the story, I'm going to talk about this link here today. Uh, there's not much of a probability, but in order to understand this probabilistic implication in the Peterson and Teichmann space, I would really take this hour to tell you about this classical geometry side uh, of the story. All right. So we first defined for Jordan curve that is Lovner energy. That has been introduced in a joint work with uh, Stefan Roda. We have a Jordan curve, and we will just parameterize it by 0, 1, where you identify 0 and 1. It's continuous map uh, to the Riemann sphere, where I also include infinity to the complex plane. It will be viewed as an oriented loop uh, from the orientation, from this uh, parameterization. Now we will define the loop energy of gamma rooted at gamma naught to be this following limit. To take a small bit of the curve from gamma zero, gamma naught to gamma epsilon, the complement of this um, green part 
where I take the complement in the Riemann sphere, the complement of that is a simply connected domain. And the orange curve is a chord in this simply connected domain. And for a chord, we know how to uh, define the, the Lovner energy of it. Right, so now we, I will just define this chordal energy of gamma of epsilon from to one. If I just re remind you what do we do is that we map the complement of this uh, green part to the upper half plane, then you have a curve from zero to infinity, you write down its driving function to compute this Dirichlet energy. So this is totally well-defined. And then we let epsilon go to zero. So now when you let epsilon go to zero, because of the additivity of the Lovna energy, when you shrink this green part, the energy on the right-hand side will increase. In it might be infinity, but uh, anyway, this limit would be, will exist. It could be infinity. This is the loop energy. Let's look at it in one example that if I, my curve is the positive free line, uh, union this eta will be the curve from zero to infinity. And I take the root to be infinity. All right, this loop energy will be taking when t goes to infinity, t is the point we're letting it go to infinity uh, of, the, of this chord here, this green part and the red part here in the complement of, the, of this first bit. From the additivity, let me just recall that the additivity of the Lovner energy says that the Lovner energy of this, in, inside any simply connected domain, it will be energy of this part will equal to the initial bit plus the second bit in the complement of the first one. So here we just apply the same thing. Here you will have the Lovner energy of this chord will be, I first add up this uh, Lovner energy of this green bit, and then the red curve in the complement of the whole positive real line. Well, this energy is zero because now this is a straight line out, coming out from another, another straight line. So if you map, when you write down its Lovner driving function of this, green part, you have to take square root of at this point, at this part, and you get the curve we're going straight up. And this is the one for constant driving function and it has zero energy. So this limit is actually always taken limit, is always zero. So what you have is in the end, this curve, this loop rooted at infinity is exactly the chordal energy of eta, of the red part. So it says that while well, the generalization, uh, the loop energy is one generalization of the chordal energy. And, um, but however, this definition doesn't, you doesn't need the curve to start from this straight line, but you can take any Jordan curve uh, like this. So maybe only one probabilistic question that will be in ho this whole hour is that, since we know that Lovner energy for chord is the large deviation rate function for SLE chord, this loop energy has to also be the large deviation rate function for SLE loops. So SLE loops is uh, one generalization of the SLE chord where uh, it's a simple loop, but if you zoom in at each part, it looks like SLE chord. So this definition, Actually, in, even just to define what is SLE loops, it's a lot of, uh, it's quite tricky. It's a lot of normalization you one needs to choose carefully. Um, but this, once you know what is SLE loop, then this is a well-defined question. And I think this is, is, is definitely true, but it's just no one has written out all the details. All right. So here from the definition, the very natural question is that whether this loop energy would depend on the root. And when we introduce this loop energy together with Stefan, we prove that it's actually independent of the root. And moreover, uh, if the energy is zero, then this uh, curve has to be a circle. If the curve passing through infinity, and this would be the case when the curve would be a straight line. And if you apply a conformal map from whole Riemann sphere, which means it's a fractional linear transformation, this will be the form AC plus B of CC plus D, then the loop energy has to be the same. This is just coming from the definition 
because quota energy is defined in conformal invariant way. This, this is uh, coming for free. Um, the last thing we showed is that if the energy is finite, then gamma is a rectifiable quasi-circle. It's a rectifiable curve, and um, being quasi-circle is one type of Jordan curve. So the most important uh, observation is that this loop energy is actually independent of this root. So if you just uh, think about how the definition here it is, uh, you will see that it's totally non-trivial because if you parameterize the curve by its capacity, so near the root, when we write down its relevant driving function near the root, uh, the, the parameterization here will be going to minus infinity from this side and plus infinity uh, if you're coming from the left-hand side here. And it seems that the root should affect a lot on this love and energy itself. Uh, but however, there's actually, this energy is totally independent of the root. But this is what I advertised that in this generalization of love and energy, there are even more symmetry about the uh, love and energy. So if you can, someone can prove the large deviation result for SLE loop, um, actually SLE loop, it has also the property of the root invariance. So then that would not be so surprising. Um, so it will, if you prove the large deviation, it will give you another proof about this result, for instance. So I'm not going to tell you the original proof about this theorem, but show you another equivalent description about loop energy that will tell you immediately this loop energy is root independent. Um, so the theorem is following. The love and energy is finite if and only if gamma is a Bay Peterson quality circle. And I will talk about them uh, very soon. And uh, moreover, we have the following identity. The love and energy can be written as the sum of these four terms. What are those? F is a conformal map. So gamma, I assume this to be a bounded Jordan curve. So this energy would be Mobius invariant. So I can just assume this is bounded curve. And I, I will send the inside of the disk to inside of the curve by a conformal map. Any conformal map F that you can choose, any of arbitrary one. And uh, G is a conformal map from outside the disk to outside of the curve, where I will ask it to fix infinity. And here is F a double prime over F prime squared delta norm of this is called the pre schwartzian of F and this pre schwartzian of G. And there's two other terms about derivative. This are normalization. So this is a very remarkable equality that uh, if you think back about how we define the Lovner energy where you have to take a limit letting epsilon go to zero and for each fixed epsilon, you have to write down the driving function of the curve. In order to define the driving function, you look at the whole family of conformal maps, which open up the slit and looking at where the tip lands on the real line. It, you have to look at a lot of conf conformal map to, in order to compute this guy. But on the right-hand side, it just tell you, it's actually a very simple expression. You just need to look at two conformal maps. And uh, they're equal. And also from the right-hand side, you see there's no root at all. Uh, so it's coming for free, it's root invariant. And it's also, there's no orientation. It doesn't, there's no orientation that is needed. Uh, so you also get reversibility for free. And remembering that the caudal energy is a general, uh, is a one particular is a special case of the loop energy. So the result I showed you yesterday about the reversibility of the love and energy, is also a consequence of this result. The proof of this theorem, I'm not going to present it, um, is totally deterministic. Uh, but however, how I come to guess this formula uh, is more related to ideas from uh, random conformal geometry um, that I'm not going to present here. Uh, so, for this whole hour, and also for what you need for tomorrow, this is the only theorem that you need to know. So this is the Lovner energy. It can even take the right-hand side as a definition of the Lovner energy. So this is the expression we are going to use tomorrow. So the, for the remaining uh, 45 minutes, I will just 
more expand on this side of what is the Peterson quasi circle, what is the Peterson Teichmann space, and uh, has not too much relation to SLE anymore. It's kind of just tell you a story about all that. Are there questions? Wait, sorry, I don't think I understood what F and G are. Yeah, F and G, they are, they are conformal maps. Uh, F is from the inside of the unit disk to inside of uh, one side of gamma, the bounded net component. Mm -hmm. And G is a conformal map from outside to outside, okay. where I ask it to fix infinity. OK, thank you. Thanks for the question. That's F fix 0. Uh, it seems 0 is also a special point. Uh, no, F doesn't need to fix 0. The curve. A uh, gamma doesn't have to uh, contain zero, for instance. Okay, but, but infinity is not in the curve. Is it assumed? Uh, sorry? Is infinity part of the complement of D? Uh, yes. Uh, yeah, uh, infinity has to be outside of the uh, curve gamma. So the gamma is assumed to be bounded. Okay. Uh, actually, so here, this infinity uh, will make, if G doesn't fix infinity, this term wouldn't be finite. And this term wouldn't be finite either. Um, so, so here, f doesn't have to fix 0. Um, you can check, actually, if I pre-compose f by a um, modus transformation of the disk. This term would change. This term would change. But their sum wouldn't change. So actually, that's why we have to in introduce uh, these two terms. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, it's not so clear because that there is still some degree of freedom to choose choosing F and G. It's not so clear. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's a very different totally quantity. Clear. Yes. Thank so you. for instance, if you apply F, uh, translate F and G, translation or dilation, it doesn't change, it's fine. But uh, the, if you like apply other movies transformation, this is not totally clear, but there are actually the sum wouldn't change. All right, if there are no more questions, I will go and get dive into this story about the Peterson touch moon space. All right, a V. Peterson quasi circle, you can take this as a definition, is a Jordan curve such that the pre Schwartzian of F, F is the same map here, um, has finite L2 norm. Here, this is the uh, area form, the Euclidean area form. All right, so here it says that this is definition. So if you have a Vay Peterson policy circle, then this term would be finite. And uh, it's actually also um, a lemma that you can show that if this is finite, then this guy is also finite. So that's why the, the definition here, you only contain this condition, then it will e automatically imply the right hand side here is finite. Uh, and vice versa, if you know that this guy here is finite, uh, then you know each of them are finite. And these are just constants. Uh, these are just numbers, and these two are positive numbers. They have to be finite. All right, so you can view this definition of a Peterson quasi circle here. It's the simplest one. Uh, but, or you can see that if you use this one as a definition, then after you having this identity, then love and energy is finite if and only if gamma is the Peterson quasi circle. This, it comes for automatically. Example, well, if gamma is C2 plus epsilon, that means that uh, gamma is C2 and whose second derivative is holder epsilon continuous. Then uh, by a classical Kellogg theorem, which says that then F is double prime would be continuous up to the boundary would be C epsilon uh, continuous up to boundary. And when it's continuous and you see it's a compact set, uh, this guy here is finite. So automatically you get this way Peterson. In fact, we can show even a weaker statement that if the C1 plus phi plus epsilon uh, would suffice. An example of a non-Way Peterson quasi circle. If you have a corner, 
This chain, we already saw that from the lambda driving function, you can see if there's a corner, then the driving function would have a one over square root t. Um, uh, the driving function would have a square root t um, increment that will have infinite Dirichlet energy. But here, from this definition, you can see also if there's a corner, then this guy would be infinite uh, because locally, this let's assume that f is sending this point zero to this point. Uh, I'm using local charts, but then f is like z to some power alpha, where alpha is not one. And it's pre-Schwarzian would behave like alpha minus one divided by z, and this function is, is not L2 integrable. All right, so whenever there's a corner, uh, it will be uh, not, not by Peters. So here you get some feeling about the way Peters and Poisson for is a rectifiable curve. Uh, it doesn't have corner, but my guess it's C1, uh, but actually this is not true. This is not C, uh, this way Peterson is a very is quite complicated to describe geometrically how it is, but we're unconnected into that. But before that, let me just give you a bit of a historical uh, review that it has been a widely studied class of curves. So in the 80s already, uh, string theorists has been looking at this family of curves. They're particularly interested in how the structure of the whole space of those curves um, are like, but they're actually only looking at those, the very smooth curve, the C infinity smooth curve of that, but they're looking at the structure on those family of smooth curve. And it's only in the beginning of the 21st century that um, in a seminal work of Chak Chak Han and Teo, they really constructed the space of a Peterson quasi circle. And uh, many other people try to study their geometric or analytic uh, care uh, properties about those curves. And uh, there's no physics there. Um, but then also later, right now, Schipper Staubach, they argued that this family of the Peterson quasi circle, they should be an important building block for a conformal field theory in the Zagel sense. Um, also, you'll see this class of curves, they actually have a structure on it. And uh, there is a certain metric where you can measure the distance between two curves of the Peterson metric. And this metric is quite useful in the computer vision computation. It's computationally nice to compute and uh, they're related to periodic KDV equations. Uh, and many people have contributed in, in that. And also uh, in a recent work of Chris B. Shop, that he studied relation of a so-called holography principle, which says that you have a Riemann sphere and uh, all the conformal automorphism of the Riemann sphere can be extended to isometry of the hyperbolic three space. You just think of you have a ball and uh, you fill the ball inside by this hyperbolic uh, three space. And uh, what you can tell on what is happening on the boundary on this ball on the sphere that can be um, translated to quantities inside the hyperbolic free space. So this is uh, by Bishop, really beautiful work. And uh, what I've been told telling you is this relation to SLE as well. And there's also a series of joint work with uh, Frederick, Frederick Wicklin that we explore more the connection to random conformal geometry. So here, this is a list that I cut from Chris Bishop's preprint. Uh, here is a list of equivalent definition of those Bay Peters and quasi circles. And they're all different. Some of them are closer to each other, but many of them are very different. And um, you're not supposed to read just from a couple of words to know that what this, the statement exactly is. And uh, I invite you to read this paper that expanded each of the definition and he showed uh, all these definition in here, this what he showed to be equivalent. And these ones, uh, they're known like since long ago. And the first one, the first one for instance, the log of a prime in Dirichlet class, that is the same definition as we gave the pre-Schwartzian in L2. And uh, 
like for instance, these five definition, they're related to geometric function theory. They, their definition involves conformal maps. And in the middle part of it, uh, there are really geometric characterization where you are only allowed to use um, length, um, distance. You can only use geometric property about those caps. And what are the angles, how large a ball you can fit in, what is oscillating a circle of this type of uh, uh, characterization. And these five definition, they're uh, related to this hyperbolic three space, uh, the holographic principle. And the last ones, there are the definitions that he hasn't touched on, but uh, like for instance, what we have been talking about, and that's related to finite love energy, large deviation of SLE zero plus, they're SLE related. So some also connection to running loop measure uh, was SLE related. Uh, there are also one definition that is equivalent that's more representation theoretic. There's a so-called Bronsky operator associated to the any Jordan curve. But if this operator is Heber Schmidt, if and only if this curve is a bit Peterson. And I will talk a bit more about this definition 21 that is from the Teichmann theory perspective. Uh, so it's just over, it's an overwhelming number of equivalent definition. And that's why it's, it's not so surprising. There's so many people have worked on it, coming from physics background, coming from uh, analyst, now probabilist starting looking at it. And it's just uh, so amazing that there are such different definitions which led to the same, same object. Like you just try to think about what is the other, last time you saw a notion which has totally different but equivalent description. And for me, I find this really overwhelming and mind-boggling or amazing. All right, so before getting into that, maybe I would tell you one, one definition I like really a lot about this hyperbolic three space. Just to remind you what the hyperbolic three space is um, either in the upper half space model, and I represent C in this plane, and H3 would be just the place of this half space, which was positive Z coordinate. And the metric here is the Euclidean metric, but divided by Z squared. So when you're getting close to the plane here, the distance getting lo longer and longer. And the geodesic in this three space, there are uh, semicircles which are, that are per perpendicular to the plane. And for geodesic, there are locally lens minimizing curves. And because the lens is getting so large when you're getting close to the boundary, so that's why they tend to get inside in order to be close, short, shorter. And uh, also, if uh, in infinity will also be part of the boundary, and uh, the geodesic to infinity are just the vertical lines. And or you can represent it in the ball model, and I just draw the C hat, the Riemann sphere as a sphere, and you fill it inside. Then the distance uh, inside will be the usual Euclidean distance, but divided by one minus the modulus squared uh, squared. And also the geodetics, there are uh, circular arcs that inside the ball, which are perpendicular to the boundary. Right, the conformal automorphism of the Riemann sphere that is given by this PSR2C, that is just to say A, B, C, D divided by C, C plus D. And they're all complex numbers and with um, determinant one. And these are transformations. So this probably, you can view this in this setup. The conformal automorphism of the uh, Riemann sphere and uh, it's the same isometry group as isometry of the inside of the hyperbolic free space. So that says, if I apply a Mobius transformation on the outside, it can be extended to isometry of um, the hyperbolic free space and vice versa. So remember that the love energy or this class of Ray Peters a quasi circle, this is a class that is invariant in the Mobius transformation. So it's very natural to ask if there is a characterization about some object inside hyperbolic 
three space, which will tell you the curve, characterize them as the Peterson quality circle. And this is one, one of the five uh, characterization given by Bishop is that gamma is by Peterson if and only if gamma bounds a minimal surface in H3. So here, I, the minimal surface that means is locally, uh, it actually means that the, the principal curvature will be um, k and minus k, they sum up to zero, they have to mean curvature is zero. And uh, so this, for instance, if you take a surface which minimizes the area, so the area actually will be infinite because it's getting close to the boundary. But if you look, make a local perturbation, and any local perturbation will increase the area, then this, curve, this surface would be a minimal surface. And uh, this result by Matteo and the um, 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 yeah, sorry, I forgot. But um, there's always, a, for any Jordan curve, there always exists a minimal surface with boundary uh, gamma. But what Bishop shows that gamma is by Peterson if and only if the total curvature of this surface is finite. The cur total curvature, it is the integral of the k squared, the principal's curvature squared, and integrated against this uh, hyperbolic area, volume, area form. So the area form here is really going to infinity, it's getting larger and larger here, but however, um, the curvature goes to zero fast enough so that this integral uh, is finite. So this is one example of the holography. However, um, his result is not quantitative. Of all his characterization, none of them are quantitative. So they always say something is finite, uh, then if and only if gamma is by Peterson. We cannot say how that is related to the Lovner energy. Although Lovner energy is finite if and only if it's by Peterson. But the reason that I, the Lovner energy is, re, is really uh, playing a crucial role in the whole story about the Peterson quality circle is because the following result. So already you can think of Lovner energy is measuring how round the curve is. The Lovner energy is zero if and only if the curve is a circle. So it's still, you feel like the larger this energy is, um, the more distorted this curve is. Uh, this is just intuition, but this following result is saying that the whole class of the Peterson quality circle has an infinite dimensional Taylor Einstein manifold structure where the Lovner energy is a Kähler potential for the Kähler metric on it. So I'm going to explain what this sentence means, but here it was telling, it's telling you that there is not only a set of body circles that you want to characterize as a collection of body circles, but also they all fit together to be an infinite dimensional space, infinite dimensional manifold. And, uh, in Kayla, uh, it will tell you that there are certain Riemannian complex and uh, symplectic structure that is fitting to fitting um, together. And Kayla Einstein means that it, the Ricci curvature is proportional to the metric tensor. Um, so all that is. Um, Right, okay, so, and whenever you have a Kähler geometry, there is a so-called Kähler potential that is playing a crucial role in this Kähler geometry. And this is the work by Takta Han and Teo. They show that, actually they didn't, didn't know what Lovner NG was, but they know what is the right-hand side. So that was, let me just scroll up here. They know what this guy is. And they, what they call this is called Leovial, universal Leovial action. And they show that this guy is the Kähler potential of the vague Peterson metric. So these are all the work by uh, Tata Line too. So I'm going to now explain what this sentence really means. All right. Uh, so first of all, we have, I've been talking about Jordan curve. We were going to associate 
the Jordan curve to its welding homomorphism. How is that defined? So you look at the same conformal maps F and G. Now, a point on the curve will be mapped by F to a point on the Jordan curve gamma on the circle from this point and map to this point. So this is by character theorem, which says if you have a Jordan curve, then the conformal map always extends to the closure. Um, so this is well defined. You have a map by F from the circle to gamma. And then you come back with G. Now this point will be pulled back from outside and to also a point on the circle. And it's not the same, might not be the same point. And how much this point is away from this point, this is this uh, welding homomorphism phi uh, is a map from S1 to S1. So I haven't told you what is a quasi circle, but you can use this as a definition. Gamma is a quasi circle if and only if this welding homomorphism, sorry, it should be H. This welding homomorphism is quasi symmetric. By quasi symmetric, it means if you take three points on the equidistant point, the exponential it, exponential it plus theta, exponential it minus theta, the three point, they're equidistant, uh, but the image and the h, their distance are proportional, uniformly bounded uh, from above and below, no matter where t and theta is. So, um, the space of quasi-symmetric uh, homomorphism is a group. And the definition of a universal tight tumor space, this is defined by uh, quasi-symmetric homomorphism when you mod out uh, from the left by Mobius transformation of the circle. In order, you can just take all the quasi-symmetric homomorphism where H fixes uh, plus minus one in minus I. So this, when you model out by Mobius transformation, Mobius transformation, they can uh, send arbitrary three point to plus minus one in minus I. And uh, this, when you model out Mobius transformation is the same as if you just fix a three point. All right. Oh, you can take this as a definition of universal Teichmann space. If I have time, I can explain why this is called Teichmann space. If you know what is Teichmann space for compact surface, actually all the Teichmann space and compact surface embedding to this universal Teichmann space. But now you can just take this as a definition. All right, so before we had, let's just come back here. Like you have a Jordan curve, we associate to a welding homomorphism. The, these two views will be same. If you start with a quasi-symmetric homomorphism, you can also get back to a curve gamma. So you have a, any element here, you will get the quasi-circle. And uh, if one look at this smaller subset, it's a diffeomorphism of this circle, diffeomorphism for being C-infinite diffeomorphism, and they will correspond to C-infinity smooth curve. And this is the object that physicists have been studying in the 80s about uh, because they use this as a parameterization group of the closed strain. And uh, they show that there is a unique homogeneous Kähler metric uh, on it. And I'm coming to that. But the guy that we are interested in here would be a space that is in, the, in between. So, this part will be contained in the quasi circle, but uh, it's a completion of the smooth curve under this way Peterson metric. All right, this is the space where the love and energy is, the curve has a finite love and energy. And this T not one, this is called the way Peterson tight tumor space. The curve are called way Peterson quasi circle. And they're a strictly smaller class than all the quasi circles. Quasi circles can have corners, for instance. Quasi circle doesn't have to be rectifiable. Um, so this is a really intermediate space. All right. So let me just um, have a digression to Kähler geometry. 
So it will be uh, very rough, um, but all right. So a Kähler structure, I will only talk about finite dimensional Kähler geometry, uh, Kähler manifold. So here you can think of those quasi circle, this is space of curves, it's infinite dimensional space. And the, the Kähler geometry theory is much more complicated. And for here, I would, in order to give you an idea what Kähler geometry means, I would restrict to the finite dimensional Kähler manifold. So for Kähler structure, it means that three compatible structures. The first one, I also use G because this is tangent. I hope this will be clear later um, which G I'm talking about. So this will be a Riemannian metric. And J will tell you what is the complex structure. And the omega will you know the symplectic form. And these three have to be compatible in, in order to be Kähler. All right. And what does that each, each term mean? Like it's, it means just start with a manifold. What do you, what is a manifold? If an n-dimensional manifold that is always coming with the atlas that you are tell you are able to tell for each neighborhood in the atlas that there is a map phi u that is sending to Rn, where u will be part of Rn, open set and Rn. And uh, um, V is another local chart, they're called local charts. And uh, they're all homomorphism to start with. So if uh, you don't have the homomorphism, the transition map or homomorphism, then you have a topological manifold. But if you, this transition map, so here this part, they're overlapping, this will do a map from this red part to on the right-hand side. Uh, if C infinite differentiable, then you get you get smooth manifold. Um, so these are the local chart, and you can also define, define tangent space. All right, so the tangent space, um, you can also get from the local charts a basis of the tangent space. The local chart, on the local chart there, um, the vectors like dx1 to dxn, and they're in one-to-one -one correspondence to um, the tangent, the base, a basis of the tangent space on the manifold. Um, so here I draw the picture like, illustrating that there's a sub-manifold of a larger space, but it doesn't have to, but this picture is just showing the idea of tangent space. So for a Riemannian metric, uh, it's a symmetric positive definite tense uh, two form, sorry, it's not two form, symmetric positive uh, definite tensor. Um, so that would depend on the point, but now you have, once you have a basis of the tangent space, you can just write down this, Riemannian metric as it's an inner product depending on the point P and it, will, it, it moves smoothly uh, in P, in show of the coordinate. Oh, example of, uh, of Riemannian metric is a Euclidean inner product. This is a Riemannian metric. All right, why this called metric? Because if you want to measure how long a pass on this manifold, you are going to like integrate the length of the velocity vector. And in order to measure how long that is, you, you can use the inner product uh, to tell what is the norm. And then you sum it up. All right, this is probably more familiar. And for a complex structure, what does that mean? So the complex structure is if I have a complex manifold, then here, uh, instead of Rn, so it's only complex structure only appears when there's even dimension. Instead of R2n, you have Cn, and all your changes that you ask this transition map to be holomorphic. Um, but sometimes it's very hard to find such a complex structure. So instead, people will use a so-called almost complex structure. So what that means is that, uh, so assume that you already have this local charts in Cn. Like you have Cn denoted by Z1 to Zk, and I can write Zk as Xk, those real coordinates. Um, and I'll obtain an operator on tangent space, which will satisfy J squared equals to minus identity, which will telling you how to multiply by I. 
or how you turn by 90 degrees. So if you are on the complex, if you for Cn, you will just send the x vector, the case x vector to the case y y vector. And uh, if you are going to send y vector to x minus x vector, you just turn uh, by 90 degrees. So this is if you have this local charting Cn, and then you also coming uh, in x the coordinate x, y, they're coming from this complex coordinate, then the complex structure, um, the almost complex structure J will be like this. And also if you apply twice, you turn twice 90 degree, then you just get minus the identity. So a one, whenever you have a complex structure, you always get the almost complex structure. And by almost complex structure, it just means this, uh, this, if you only have this thing, and also some smooth dependence on P, um, that is called almost complex structure. It's not the case that all the almost complex structure integrates to uh, a complex structure, but if you have a complex structure, you always get almost complex structure. All right. The symplectic structure. All right, symplectic structure, it also only exists for even dimension manifold. And not all manifold has symplectic structure, but um, uh, so that is a two form. Okay, you have also local charts and those one form, uh, this wedge is telling you this alternative, alternating. Uh, so it will have a coefficient uh, depending on P. For a symplectic form, I asked it to be non-degenerate for each P. That means uh, if you have for some U, which uh, omega you apply to two vectors U and V, in the tangent space, if it's equal to zero for all the V, then U has to be zero as well. This means non degenerate. And it also asks this symplectic form to be closed, uh, which is the exterior derivative has to be zero. And uh, it's explicitly, you can compute, compute in the local charts this um, its exterior derivative, you by taking the derivative. Uh, case derivative with this guy, and uh, you put it in a dxk into the, the other. So this will be a three form. So these are, uh, when, when you say there, this is a symplectic form, it means that no degenerate and the closed. At the end, uh, we say that these three structures are compatible, then we call it Kala. And by compatibility, it just means that if take omega u j v will give you the Riemannian metric um, g of u v for any u v for any p. At the end, uh, whenever there's a Kähler Kähler structure, there is always a Kähler potential which is defined locally. So when u is a ball, for instance. Um, you can always define a Kähler potential, which means that if you time i times d d bar of this scalar function, this is just taking number in real number. Okay, this is just real number. Um, you take d d bar, you will recover this inflected form. Or how to what, what does this mean? So I will use this complex notation that d x d z k is d x k plus i d y k dz bar k is dxk minus i dyk. And for the vector field, so this is for one form, and this is for the vector field. Vector field is defined this way. And uh, this operator, the Dolbot uh, operator, um, that is, have a function, you take its complex derivative in ZK and multiply um, by this uh, one form. All right, I will show you an example uh, of that. Right. And here, like saying that I of dd bar of this scalar function equals to omega, it's just saying that omega is uh, here, I omit the sum, but here you should have my j. Uh, if you take 
Okay, this is not the same I, but this is index. Yeah. So here you have that omega is the uh, two derivative of one in D, the other in D bar in The, with the moment form here. Uh, can you see my? Uh, can you see my screen, Ruby? Yes. Yes. Yes, we can see. Uh, yeah. Okay. So uh, the complex plane, you have the Riemannian metric, which is the Euclidean Riemannian metric, dx squared dy squared. The tangent space itself will be uh, spanned by uh, x direction, y direction. The complex structure would be the usual one, dx equals dy, and uh, the y direction move to minus dx. And the symplectic form uh, is dx wedge dy. Now this is also the volume, Euclidean volume form. Right, and uh, okay, just write down what is the complex uh, derivatives, a uh, complex form, the dz. Right, we can check that uh, omega is omega is um, compatible with G by looking at I just apply to this x and y omega dx j dy and let's check is omega dx minus dx so this is the same vector omega is an alternating form so this has to be zero and if I apply to both to dx. I get omega is here. This is by definition here. This is uh, omega is dx plus dy, so this is equal to one. And check the same for y. So it, it exactly have the same formula than the Riemannian metric itself. So they are compatible. This is scalar. All right. And what is the scalar potential here? Uh, scalar potential uh, it would be for the point z. It will just be z squared over two the modulus or can write x squared plus y squared over two or like the zz bar over two. I can check that, what is this? And d bar of i, you take d bar, you take a d bar derivative of this function, you would just get z over two. And I put in this dz bar here. And now I take d differential, I take, so that would take a derivative here of z, we get just one, one half. And so this i over two dz which dz bar. After expanding, you will find out this is exactly omega. All right, so this is a, a very, I show you one of the simplest uh, Kähle manifold and what is a Kähle potential on it. But upshot is that once you know the Kähle potential, what it is, once you know how to take, what is the complex structure, how to take this dz bar derivative then you can recover this omega. So let's come back to here. Like This is always like you, you learn the simplest example, then in the exercise, you give you both an infinite dimensional Kähler geometry that's uh, totally 100 times harder. Um, yeah. So, so the, there's a question, what is the difference between quasi-symmetric and the Peterson quasi-circle? Um, so for the quasi-circle, this is a larger class than the Peterson quasi-circle. The quasi-circle is where the homomorphism is uh, quasi-symmetric. Actually, the quasi-circle, I haven't defined for you, but it's uh, the image of a round circle under quasi-conformal maps. Uh, here, the Peterson quasi circle, they're a special type of quasi circle. It's, so, not all the quasi, not all quasi circle are Bay Peterson. Is that okay? Thank you. Okay. Yes. All right. So, here we are. Let's talk about this. 
Um, so physicists already studied this space where you, there is infinite dimensional Kähler manifold structure there. And explicitly, what does that mean? All right, okay, so here also, it asks this Taylor metric to be homogeneous. So here it's a group. So you can act on the right by different morphism. And when you act on the right, it will transfer tangent space to other points. And saying this homogeneous is saying that all the structure, um, you, can, you can just compute at identity at the origin and then uh, the inner product or complex structure or the symplectic form, they will also be just translated by the right position. So this is one requirement. Um, the other requirement say, it, the, the thing is most important thing is there's is a unique one. So there's a unique homogeneous Kähler metric on this, on this um, space. A little sounds fancy, but it's actually not hard to check that once you know that it has to be homogeneous and you know this symplectic form has to be closed. Um, uh, it can give you some information about what is happening at the tangent space of the identity. The identity map, identity homomorphism is the one co corresponding to the circle. And one can write down what exactly the J is, what is the Ray Peterson inner product. So this should be G U V, Ray Peterson inner product. So for an element in tangent space, that will be a vector field on the circle. So what is thinking about what is tangent space? How you move inside the morphism of the circle that you should tell at each point on the circle in which direction is heading, right? It's a, so it's given by a vector field on the circle. And you can write down its uh, Fourier transform. So all this uh, Hilbert transform, uh, so the complex structure is given by the Hilbert transform, which is simply changing the coefficient by I sine N. And uh, in other words, cosine N theta will be mapped to minus sine N theta and sine theta will go to cosine N theta. The inner product here uh, is you take the product, inner product of the uh, coefficient, Fourier coefficient, that multiplied by N cubed minus N. And this, if you're familiar with, with Virasoro, you can see this is coming, here is the Virasoro cycle that's coming up. But here, which won't be too surprising is also because, remember, we are looking at the space where you mod out by Möbius transformation and the Möbius transformation, they're given in the vector field, they are given by the plus minus one and zero mode in the Fourier, the Fourier transform. So if you have multiplied by n cubed minus n, this is exactly will kill all this plus minus one and zero modes. But probably most striking thing, although this is actually an exercise, that once there's only one degree of freedom that is multiplying by this uh, metric by a constant in order to, for it to be compatible three. Um, structure. And uh, there are more work getting into Tatahan tail. Uh, so here, all we describe is that what is this operator J turning 90 degree is almost complex structure. And they have to really provide the local charts and uh, to tell this is an integrable uh, complex structure, which indeed you can construct the complex charts to c to the power infinity. Um, yeah, right here. So all this it works for smooth uh, diffeomorphisms, but you can see that already for this inner product to converge, it doesn't need that u n b n decrease super fast. It, it's finite as long as this inner product uh, it is. This is finite. For if you have a smooth diffeomorphism here, then u n b n they decay faster than only in any polynomial. polynomial. Um, yeah. Right, right, this is, uh, so there's a question. Right, what is the form omega here? Right, the form of omega here will be, uh, you can actually, this is thing, right? If you have 
you know they are compatible, then you can recover it from any two to the third one. So now I tell you what is J, what is uh, G, what is inner product, and omega will be defined in a way uh, like this. And then you have to check that this omega is closed, it's a symplectic bone, it's a uh, non degenerate. Yeah. Right. So, so what Tata Hontail and they did is really construct this T01 as the completion, which will make uh, it's the largest space where this is converging. And um, they also showed that, let me just come back to this picture. That you can actually put this structure also on this larger space, T1, um, but then this space will be disconnected. Uh, Right, uh, Sergey. Yes. So you are asking about well, what is omega. What is what is what omega? Is, omega. Is omega? Or, yeah. Here, I'm omega. Saying what that is? If you know what is J, you you know what is uh, G, you know what is omega. It's defined. It will be defined as uh, such that this thing they are equal, they hold. So if you want, I can just write U V equals U minus J V. All right, you, you know what is J? Okay, you know thank this. you. Yeah, and uh, uh, so you, you need to know this. This you, I can define it this way. Then you have to check this is a symplectic form. Yeah, so that is the other thing. But to define it is just, uh, I, I only need to give two and the third one. It will, it will come for, but the definition will come for free. Then we need to check this homogeneous. It's, um, it's closed, it's non-degenerate. Um, all right. Right. So yeah, and then their result, the last result I'm stating is that this Lovna energy is a global Kähler potential of the V Peterson Kähler form. Actually, this because um this V Peterson Teichmann space is contractible. Um, the Kähler potential is not only defined locally, but it can actually be defined globally. And this is this scalar function, and uh, which captures the Bay-Peterson metric, which is the unique Bay-Peterson unique Kähler metric on this infinite-dimensional space. And magically, um, the Lovna energy is a Kähler potential of it. So they show this result for this functional, um, they call universal level action. Um, but what the result I showed you was that this Lovna energy defined using driving function is equal to this level action. So this is uh, this result I find is very mysterious and uh, there are proofs, but uh, um, there are a lot of things that we need to understand about what exactly, why is this miracle happens, why the probabilistic motivated Lovna energy could be um, this Kähler potential, the unique Kähler metric on this space. And that's also why I say that um, Lovna energy is a fundamental quantity about this class of the Peterson quality circle. And uh, although the results that Chris Bishop gave that the qualitative characterization of the Peterson quality circle, they're very exciting. It will be really great to know that if there are any quantitative relation of his quantities, how that related to love and energy itself. Um, right, okay, so uh, my time, I'm sorry for running over time. And uh, I prepared some other slides about uh, diversion of titrium spaces. Um, but these are really classical stuff. And, and if you're interested in Teichman theory, um, yeah, you can feel free to look through the notes that I was in.